Uh, I'm Dan Snyder. I'm the Associate Director for Research at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. And it's a really great pleasure for me to uh, moderate and host this event. This panel discussion on, we've titled it From Boom to Bust and Back, the Media and the Japanese Economy, is taking place in uh, association with the annual uh, award which the Shorenstein Center gives for coverage of Asia. And it's an award that was started in uh, 2002, I believe. And we, in the early days of the award, we uh, gave it only to uh, Western American journalists, and it was meant to uh, recognize them not for individual stories, but for their careers uh, in covering Asia and in helping Americans to better understand Asia. And in the last three or four years, um, we reconceived the award, and we now alternate it between uh, Asian journalists uh, who are at the forefront particularly of trying to establish an independent media in Asia and the original uh, target of our awardees. And, and this year, uh, it's the American turn or the Western turn. And uh, we're, we're really uh, excited to, for many reasons, uh, to, to give the award, which will be done tonight at a, at a special dinner, to Jake Schlesinger, who's to my to my right, as you're looking on, um, who uh, is a Wall Street Journal, veteran Wall Street Journal correspondent, and uh, by way of important personal uh, reference and admission, uh, <laughs> uh, is also my brother-in-law, but that has nothing to do with the decision. Uh, more importantly, uh, three of the people on this panel, uh, Jake Schlesinger and to his right, Susan Chira, who's the deputy executive editor of the New York Times. We, in our much younger days, uh, were all uh, journalists in, uh, in Tokyo together and covering the, the boom days, the boom part of the boom to bust. And I think it was a formative experience for all of us. And we've all remained friends over the years. And we've all remained engaged uh, with Japan and in watching Japan, and uh, but uh, pro probably only amongst us, Jake actually returned to Japan uh, to uh, take a second shot at uh, trying to figure out what goes on in Japan and, and what goes on particularly in the Japanese economy. So we thought it would be, uh, in association with the award ceremony tonight, we thought this would be a good uh, subject for our panel discussion. And we're joined by Takeo Hoshi, who's the uh, director of the Japan program here at Stanford and a wonderful economist, uh, uh, one of the best financial economists I think there is a, a, on Japan. And uh, we're the, the subject that which we're all going to discuss, uh, not myself, but the three, of, three people to my, to my right, is to look at how the Japanese economy is seen through the prism of uh, the media. And I think this is a, a, an interesting subject because it, there has been a tendency over the years in which I at least personally will uh, admit I was a participant in uh, sort of typecasting the Japanese economy, either as a boom economy, and in the 1980s there was all, of course, the fear uh, that was uh, layered on to that, that Japan was going to march on and take over the world. And then there was the great bust and sort of nothing in between. And Japan, in many ways, sort of disappeared uh, uh, from the scene, as if somehow or other it had ceased to exist uh, for, for many people. And now we're in this interesting period where we have Japan, as Prime Minister Abe likes to say, Japan is back. Uh, and we have a revival of the Japanese economy and a revival of interest and awareness of Japan and Japan's role uh, under the label of Abenomics. And so uh, it's a good moment to sort of think about how we have understood and looked at Japan uh, over the years. And that's sort of the goal of this panel, first through the eyes of our award recipient and Susan Chira, who besides having been the uh, a Tokyo correspondent for the New York Times for many years, and we were all there in the second half of the 80s, I would say. Jake, I think, went beyond that point. Um, uh, w was the longtime foreign editor of the New York Times. Uh, under her leadership, the New York Times won four Pulitzer Prizes for international reporting. Uh, 
Uh, so she's been engaged in the direction of the New York Times coverage of Japan for a long time after she left there, as well as she is now the deputy uh, executive editor of the Times and in charge of the news coverage of the New York Times. So she uh, brings that perspective of, from, as an editor in New York. Um, and just to say a few words about Jake, but uh, I won't say much because I think we, we want to move on here. Uh, and we'll say a lot about him tonight. Not all of you will be there. But um, I think a very important thing for this audience to know is that after uh, a great job in Japan, w in which he covered not only Japanese, the Japanese economy, but Japanese politics. And I think actually in some ways Japanese politics was his first real true love. Uh, he's a political reporter uh, in his heart. And uh, he wrote, he came here to Shorenstein A. Park at the invitation of Dan Okimoto, who's here, and uh, wrote a terrific book uh, about Japanese politics, uh, Shadow Shoguns, The Rise and Fall of Japan's Post-War Political Machine, which is still, I think, a, a book that has tremendous uh, relevance to the politics of Japan today. Uh, and then he went on, spent 13 years in, uh, in Washington, most of it, a lot of it, covering American politics, as well as uh, economic policy, and uh, he only after that did he, as I said, return back to uh, to Japan. And he's uh, he initially went back to Japan as the uh, bureau chief for uh, Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones, and immediately, or not almost immediately, was thrust into the middle of sort of multiple crises, the 311 disaster, and all of the aftermath of that, uh, as well as the big political changes that had taken place in Japan with the, the uh, loss of power by the LDP and the coming to power of the opposition party for the first time in Japanese politics in a long time. So he had some rather large stories uh, to deal with. And then the return to power uh, of the conservatives and, as I said, the sort of the, the re-rise maybe of uh, Japan as a, as a major economic power. So he's had a, a lot on his plate, and uh, he's done a terrific job with it, and that's why, of course, we decided to recognize him for this, and why I think you'll have a lot to listen to today. So the order of business is that Jake will speak first, uh, and Susan will follow, and then Takeo will take up the, as the economist looking on at the journalists, <laughs> will uh, get the last <laughs> word. So. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you all for, um, for making it here today. Uh, it's a great honor to, to make sure this is a I usually talk loud enough that it's not crucial. If you can't hear me, speak up. Um, it's a great honor to be given this award uh, following the footsteps of, of a number of distinguished chroniclers of Asia, both American and Asian, uh, such as Ian Burma, Stanley Carno, and two former winners we're privileged to have here today, uh, Nayan Chanda and Orville Shell. Um, I'm thrilled also to be able to share this panel uh, with great thinkers on Japan, on journalism and on economics, and the nexus between them. Uh, Dan Snyder, Sue Chair of the New York Times, and Takeo Hoshi, uh, from here at Stanford. Um, as Dan said, the subject that Sue Takeo and I have been asked to address is Japan's economy from boom to bust and back. And the back has a question mark, so I guess boom, bust, and back. Um, and I think that that's certainly an apt frame uh, from my own experiences covering the subject uh, on and off, as Dan has said, for the past quarter century. Um, when I moved to Japan for the first time, it was actually in April of 1989. So it was the the very tail end of, of the bubble. Um, I went uh, in order to cover what I thought would be and what was widely uh, hailed in the West at the time as a new form of world dominating super capitalism. And yet, uh, less than a year later, the bubble had burst, literally and figuratively. Japan's stock market was in free fall. Uh, its economy was on the precipice of what would turn out to be one of the more remarkable super slumps in the history of modern capitalism. Uh, and then when I returned to Tokyo, as Dan said, after an extended absence in the fall of 2009, uh, I was in for a second surprise, another disparity between my expectations from reading the press and other things and uh, 
what turned out to be what appeared to me to be the reality on the ground. I had expected to see an economy in deep distress. This was, after all, well into what had been branded the country's second lost decade of decline. Uh, and yet there were none of the telltale signs of recession, of slump, that you would expect to see in the United States. No boarded up storefronts, garbage piles, beggars, trashed subway stations, any hint of serious street crime. Instead, I was taken aback to see a city, a country, that if anything had spiffed up considerably since the last time I'd lived there. After two lost decades, Tokyo looked better, felt better, worked better than Boomtown, Washington, DC, which was my hometown for much of the period between my two Tokyo stints. And then in the last couple of years of my Japan assignment, I've had the opportunity to watch this kind of manic depressive assessment of Japan's economy play out uh, in an accelerated time lapse. Uh, in early 2013, there was the giddy optimism that a new prime minister had the magic el elixir of Abenomics to s instantly catapult Japan from its long stupor to reclaim at least some of the glory days of old prosperity. This was a cover in The Economist magazine uh, in the spring of 2013 of Abe as Superman. And then by the end of 2014, the widespread popular conclusion had changed, which is that Abenomics had failed. This was a cartoon playing off The Economist cover uh, in an American newspaper. Uh, and this was the cover about a year after The Economist, this one from Foreign Affairs about, again, voodoo Abenomics. So what's my point here? I mean, I guess at a simplistic level, it would be that nobody really ever has a handle on what's going on in Japan's economy, <coughs> present company accepted, of course. Um, but I realize that's probably not enough to earn my lunch or to justify your having come here today. So before I turn the mic over to the other panelists, um, let me try and come up with a better framework for how to think about coverage and analysis of Japan's economy over the past quarter century, the ever-shifting perceptions and realities and the gaps between the two. I begin by noting that ever since Japan's rather remarkable emergence out of isolation uh, into world power in the late 19th century, Americans have tended to look at Japan's economy with a combination of awe and fear and sometimes disdain and dismissal. As far back as 1895, the US Secretary of the Navy at the time, Hilary Herbert, wrote that, quote, Japan has leaped almost at one bound to a place among the great nations of the earth. The world now comprehends the startling fact that this small island kingdom, so little taken account of heretofore in the calculations of students and statesmen, has within a few decades stridden over ground traversed by other nations only within centuries, end quote. As the first non-Western nation to be followed only really recently by Korea, Taiwan, and China to create a modern advanced economy, Japan's strain of capitalism has seemed both familiar and foreign at times not just a competitor, but a rival in defining the very ways that market economies are supposed to work. Our own fluctuating perceptions of Japan's economy have stemmed at least in part from our own ever-shifting attempt to grapple with what we consider to be the universal principles of economics and how they interact with different political systems, cultures, and values. Now, to explain what I mean by all that, I'd like to look at the past quarter century of Japan's economy in three phases. First, the boom-turn bubble of the late 1980s, second, the so-called lost decades of the 1990s and 2000s, and third, Abenomics from late 2012 to the present. So starting with the boom and looking back at that golden age, I should say in a personal note that what became my own sort of extended involvement with Japan originated with what could be called a rather callow, youthful obsession with Japan's late 1980s bubble. At the time, I'd never been to Japan, I'd never studied Japan or Japanese, and to be honest with you, I really had no interest in Japan. But I was a junior reporter in the Wall Street Journal's Detroit Bureau, and I was looking for adventure and, to be honest, a way to get out of Detroit. And Japan at that time was a really hot story. So hot, in fact, that I turned down a chance, uh, putting your mind back, this was late 1988, early 1989, to go instead to what was then our West Germany Bureau. When I raised my hand for Tokyo, our foreign editor asked me to consider Berlin instead. She was having such a hard time finding anybody to take that job, she said I could literally go there the next day if I wanted. But as eager as I was to get out of Detroit, I didn't hesitate one bit to wait for an opening in Tokyo. Sure, Germany was a cool story, communism was ending, but I was more interested in seeing what was going to replace it as the next big threat to America's dominance. As scholar Chalmers Johnson famously said at the, famously said at the time, the Cold War is over and Japan has won. Now, silly as that may sound now, it's understandable when viewed through the prism of that time. In 1987, a Time magazine cover showed Uncle Sam staring down a menacing and much larger beefy sumo wrestler <laughs> under yeah. the headline, Trade Wars, the US Gets Tough with Japan. <clears throat> Newsweek that year countered with the ominous sounding cover, Your Next Boss May Be Japanese. And two years later, when Sony bought Columbia Pictures, Newsweek came out with an even more incendiary cover. That's the one over there on, on your right. 
uh, the Columbia woman holding a torch dressed in kimono under the headline, Japan Invades Hollywood. And as the story inside the magazine put it, this time the Japanese hadn't just snapped up another building, they bought a piece of America's soul. As an aside, I'd note that one hallmark of press coverage at that time was that Japanese companies were rarely portrayed as independent corporate entities, but rather part of a national monolith. It was rarely Mitsubishi buys Rockefeller or Sony buys Columbia. It was Japan or the Japanese. And they weren't just buying, but they were invading. In what was a seminal influential work at the time, James Fallows wrote a cover story for Atlantic Magazine titled Containing Japan, an intended allusion to George Kennan's famous early Cold War treatise arguing for containment of the Soviet Union. Fallows wrote of Japan's, quote, inability or unwillingness to restrain the one-sided and destructive expansion of its economic power, end quote. After nodding to neoclassical arguments that Japan's economy would eventually collapse under its own weight, Fallows concluded, however, the limits are purely theoretical. No symptom of slowdown can be observed. By every measurable indication, Japan is distinctly on the rise. Amid such coverage, it was to much to my excitement that not only was I going to be arriving in Tokyo at this heady time, but it was my beat to cover the tip of the spear of Japan's juggernaut, the ascendant world-beating technology industry. Now, I have, I have vivid memories of competing with Susan's uh, New York Times colleague, uh, the, De the incredible David Sanger, who's also now in Washington. And we were scrambling for scoops on uh, Japanese advances in satellites, supercomputers, and which company was going to be the first to make the jump from four megabit DRAMs to 16 megabit DRAMs an incredibly closely watched turning point in the global tech industry at the time that was for sure going to leave Silicon Valley conclusively in the dust once and for all. I still get it, recall getting rockets from my New York editors on an 1800 word story by David uh, in 1990, <laughs> uh, a story about X-ray lithography machines. Uh, I have to admit I'd never heard of them until David's story, but it turns out that they were the advanced equipment that, that held the key to making 256 megabit DRAMs. And as David's story revealed, Japan had a dozen X-ray lithography machines in the works, and the U.S. had just one. Now, so it's not just to pick on David in the Times, I'll recount one of my own pieces uh, that did not withstand well the test of time. I did a story on Japan's software factories uh, and how by figuring out an efficient way to mass produce code, uh, Japanese companies were challenging America's dominance in computer programming and design. So we all know now that none of that happened. Contrary to the Fallows argument, the limits for Japan's expansion were in fact much more than theoretical, and contrary to my report, Japan could not manufacture its way to software dominance. I suppose David's story was correct in that Japan did drive America largely out of the DRAM business and may well have taken the lead in 256 megabit DRAMs. Nobody really remembers because it turns out it didn't really matter. DRAMs became commodities and Korea and Taiwan soon drove Japan out as well while Americans enjoyed the cheap chips to help fuel their next wave of dominance in the next generations of electronic products. So what did we all get wrong? Well, some, of course, was just classic universal timeless bubble analysis. The longer a bubble goes on, the less credible become those who lost money warning that it was unsustainable, and the more popular become theories on why this time is different. The justifications for Japan's seemingly gravity-defying growth were really no different from the late 1990s American analysis that Pets.com and the like were the next big thing and that eyeballs mattered more than profits and revenue. But there was also a bit more going on with Japan, I think. Despite our conclusive military victory over Japan in 1945, our seven-year occupation and our close military and diplomatic alliance in the following decades, Americans still warily tended to see Japan's advance in the context of a dangerous military rival. In 1971, even well before Japan's bubble rise, Richard Nixon declared that Japan's economic threat was, quote, far more serious than the challenge that we confronted even in the dark days of Pearl Harbor, end quote. In addition, I think our analysis was shaped as much by our views, our doubts about ourselves as by what was happening with Japan. Despite the 1980s Reagan expansion, it was a time of worries about the durability of the American economy and a look for alternative economic strategies. Japan's focus on industrial policy, of smart bureaucrats picking winners and losers like DRAMs and X-ray lithography, seemed far more effective than our leaving things to the chance of laissez-faire. The primacy of shareholders in American business decision-making seemed to force an unhealthy short-term focus on profits over long-term growth. Nicholas Brady, who was uh, the first President Bush's Treasury Secretary in the late 1980s, said that American shareholder-driven short-term quarterly focus was what he worried about every morning in the shower. In 1991, more than a year after Japan's bubble had burst, which we of course know in hindsight, we, the Wall Street Journal, still had a column on our front page, Dateline Tokyo, that began like this, quote, 
In the US, corporate managers usually pair spending when the economy slows. Not so in Japan, where managers simply increase spending a little less rapidly. The implications of that distinction are ever more ominous. After a marathon expansion, the world's second largest economy is looking haggard, at least by Japanese standards. But instead of taking a breather, Japan Inc. continues to pump huge sums into plant and equipment. The result, economists say, Japanese companies soon will leave international rivals panting in their dust. At one point, midway through the piece, it did note that, quote, in a way, Japan's commitment defies economic convention. Its corporations continue to spend in spite of evidence the economy is slowing, end quote. And while the column quickly dismissed that notion, that proved to be the one accurate part of the piece. Rather than leaving anybody in the dust, Japanese companies were digging themselves into a huge hole, building a massive overcapacity with outmoded factories that took more than a decade to work off. And so now we're lecturing Japan about how their problem is they don't pay enough attention to shareholders. Indeed, one of the key revival reforms of the moment is for Japan to try and create a more shareholder, profit-oriented focus. In other words, what burst at some point in the early 1990s wasn't just the economic bubble, but the whole school of thought in the West that Japan was a menacing rival and that it had concocted a better strain of capitalism, as well as the trope that Japan was continuing to wage World War II under other means. In part, we just stopped paying attention to Japan. In his 2002 book, uh, U.S.-Japan Relations in a Changing World, Berkeley's Stephen Vogel charted the sharp drop in Japanese coverage in the American press. You can see this line is Japan. Uh, this is the number of articles in the New York Times, I guess, by year. Uh, and you can see it peaking, certainly exceeding the other three countries mentioned here. And then the sharp, steady plunge along with the Nikkei average that I showed you at the beginning. So now it's sort of at the level of Mexico and Canada. Um, and when we did manage to pay attention to Japan, our assessment went to the opposite extreme of where it had been just a few years earlier. Rather than a fearsome machine we needed to study, we concluded that Japan was a basket case that needed to be more like us. And I think there has been and continues to be a bit of a flaw in how we apply that logic. It's the mirror image of our analysis of bubble Japan. <clears throat> that is, in the 1980s, we felt Japan had somehow found a way to defy the laws of economic gravity, and they didn't apply to Japan. In the two decades since, we've concluded that because economic forces apply to Japan the same way they do to us, they need to make the same choices in response and to seek the same outcomes that we do, and that if they don't, that they've somehow failed. Now, to be clear, I don't mean to say that contrary to popular belief, the past quarter century has been a roaring economic success for Japan. But what I do mean is that by some measure, Japan's lost decades haven't been nearly as bad as widely portrayed. It's true that the economy as a whole has stagnated, but on a price-adjusted per capita basis, that is, adjusting for deflation and a shrinking population, Japan's growth for each Japanese citizen has, for much of the lost decades, actually been on par with, and sometimes even better than, the US and the rest of the group of seven advanced economies. And to the extent that Japan has sacrificed growth, that hasn't just been the fault of stupid mistakes and screw-ups, but the result of understandable, legitimate choices that reflect different priorities from ours. In many ways, Japan, in contrast with the US, tends to prefer control, predict predictability, and egalitarianism over growth for its own sake. Consider that over the long run, there are really only two main ways to raise an economy's potential to grow, to increase the size of your labor force, and to make the labor force that you do have more productive, more efficient. One solution that we in America like to invoke to raise the size of the workforce is immigration. Japan, which places a much higher premium on racial, social, cultural heterogeneity, doesn't want to go there. I distinctly remember a bank yokai, a study group that I attended during my first stint in Japan, when its economy was still seen as doing well, but people were starting to worry about the prospect of its aging and shrinking population. This study group was held at what was then known as MITI, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, which has since been rebranded as METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. It's the ministry that was widely seen and portrayed at the time as a chief strategist behind Japan's remarkable growth. So lionized in Chalmers Johnson's MITI in the Japanese Miracle, and Dan Okimoto's more sober and balanced between media and the market. And I asked the group of media bureaucrats, if you had to choose between a Japan that grows 2 to 3 percent, or 2 to 4 percent, uh, with open immigration, or a Japan that grows between 0 and 1 percent without immigration, which would you choose? And without missing a beat, the very people who were tasked with fostering Japanese growth answered zero growth with no immigration. That is, it's a choice that they knew they were making, understanding the consequences. So if you want to boost your economy's long-run growth rate, but you'd rather not turn to policies that can expand your labor force, you can turn to policies to raise the productivity of your existing labor force. One solution that we in the US like is labor market flexibility. 
which is often a euphemism for giving companies the freedom to fire and lay off their workers. That's not something Japanese are comfortable with either. On Friday, here in the United States, the big economic news was that the unemployment rate fell to 5.5%, our tightest labor market in many years. And the report was taken as a sign that our economic expansion is moving full speed ahead. By way of comparison, 5.5% was Japan's peak, the highest that unemployment got in Japan during its lost decades. And it's now 3.6%, a level well below what we would consider even conceivable in the United States. Such low unemployment, the result among other things of strong formal and informal restrictions on layoffs, has come at a cost for Japan. It's imposed hugely inefficient burdens on companies who were forced to keep workers they didn't need. And when employers couldn't cut workers, they cut wages instead. So there was certainly in pa pain imposed on the labor force, as you would expect in any recession. It was just spread more broadly than it would be in the US. And that was a choice that Japanese society made. Former Bank of Japan Governor Masaaki Shirakawa has talked about low unemployment and the costs as a kind of social compact. Mild deflation, he once put it, quote, has been to some extent a price that Japanese society has paid to secure maximum employment. Another force that we Americans believe crucial for raising productivity and economy's ability to grow faster is subjecting companies' managers to shareholder pressure, assuming that shareholders will force companies to make the most efficient use of their resources. That may well be. But Japanese companies and society tend to think of a broader series of stakeholders that include not just workers, but suppliers and customers. In a widely cited survey of managers from companies in Japan and other countries from the mid-1990s, one question was which managers considered more important, job security for their workers or dividends for their shareholders. And if you look at the panel that's on your left, 97% uh, of Japanese managers said that it was job security for the workers that was most important. 89% of American companies said it was dividends for their shareholders. And if you look at the right, whose company is it? Uh, again, 76% of Americans said it was uh, the shareholders' company. 97% of Japanese managers said it was broader stakeholders. I went recently to a briefing by a Japanese economist who was reviewing some of the commonly prescribed ailments in Japan's economy that seemed to require fixing. One area that she focused on was Japan's lagging efficiency, its lagging productivity, particularly in the service sector. International comparisons showed that productivity output per worker uh, in Japanese transport, retail, um, and hotels and restaurants, oops, sorry, in particular, see the, the last three levels here, show that productivity in Japan is at best about a third, to, but well below a half of what it is in the US in those sectors. So from the standpoint of the economist who was giving this presentation, that was a clear weakness that needed to be rectified. But when she was done, an American reporter based in Japan raised his hand and said, um, have you been to an American hotel or American restaurant lately? Do you really want Japanese hotels and restaurants to be that productive? <laughs> Indeed, you might, whatever you might think about the relative efficiency of the Japanese service sector, I'd say most people who have experienced it would say the quality is considerably higher than anything that you would find in the United States. And what's striking about Japanese service is that it's offered at all levels for all customers, not just the high-end establishments. If you see a line of more than three people at a 7-Eleven in Tokyo, the cashier will call out Reggie for register, and somebody will magically come out sprinting from somewhere to open a second cash register, apologizing for having kept you waiting. Japanese inefficiency has created an economy, a society, that's amazingly safe, clean, and functional. None of those things, customer service, safety, functional public infrastructure, get captured in an economy's growth rate. But they're understandable choices that Japan has made for an economy and society that, by its standards, works pretty well. And I might add, that's an intangible that takes some of the sting out of one of the most popular concerns in the United States and worldwide today, income inequality. Much has been made of Japan's rising poverty rate over the last two decades, and that is a problem. But consider the immeasurable distinction between being poor in a country where that doesn't condemn you to a dangerous neighborhood and your kids to failing schools, where you still have access to reliable public transport and can expect respectful service wherever you go. In sum, it's not obvious why the Japanese, even after two lost decades, would conclude that A, they've really got a serious problem, or B, they should try to become more like us. Now, my point isn't to say that's right. And my point isn't to say that for all that's gone right for Japan during its lost decades, there haven't been problems. The social compact of discouraging layoffs made companies hesitant to hire new workers with good salaries and benefits. Japan's low jobless rate came with more low-paying, part-time, or temporary jobs, especially for young people who came of age in the deflation era. If the lost decades may have been a misnomer for Japan as a whole, they have arguably created a lost generation. And there are reasons that countries care about overall growth, not just per capita growth. One is public debt. 
Japan has by far the highest public debt per GDP in the world, as you can see literally off the charts. They had to extend the chart for Japan's debt ratio. <coughs> um, and that is a problem um, because the debt has exploded not so much because spending has exploded so much, but because the economy has stagnated. And that means that the economy as a whole is going to have a harder time finding the resources ultimately to pay off that debt. And a stagnating economy, even a comfortable one, simply becomes less relevant globally. One clear trend from the last decades was the shrinking importance of Japan to nations around Asia and the growing importance of China. At the peak of the bubble, Japan's economy was something like 20 times the size of China. Now it's half. What this chart shows is uh, in 1995 versus 2012, the significance of Japan's uh, economy as a trade partner with countries around Asia. And what you can say, Japan is the blue line, China is the red, that in 1995, Japan was clearly the most important economic partner for most of the region. By 2012, China dominates significantly with the, the one exception of Indonesia where it's now about even. And so it's no real surprise that the leader of the newly ascendant political movement to break Japan's law and stagnation is Shinzo Abe, a politician much better known for a strong nationalism than an interest in economics. Mr. Abe's first ill-fated brief stint as prime minister for just one year, year ending in September 2007, was devoted mainly to policies aimed at what he considered restoring Japan's national pride. This time, since taking office in December 2012, he's been much more focused on Abenomics. Abenomics, as you probably know, is crafted around three pillars, three arrows of monetary policy, fiscal policy, and structural reforms. The goal is ambitious, to break Japan's long stagnation and to put the country back on a long-term growth path of 2% or more, roughly on a par with the US and other advanced economies. Will it do so? My view, as the journalist analyzing the economy, is probably not. Uh, as I said earlier, the main policies to boost an economy's long-term growth would entail reforms designed to expand the workforce or labor productivity. That's the focus of the third arrow of structural reforms. Mr. Abe's blueprint has identified many of the changes that could, if pursued aggressively, have the potential to hit that target of significantly faster growth, including more immigration and more labor market reforms. But contrary to his pledge, made at Davos just over a year ago to, quote, act like a drill bit strong enough to break through the solid rock of vested interests, end quote. Mr. Abe has actually instead been much more like a sculptor, chipping gently around the edges of current Japanese customs and practices. To put it in the frame I gave earlier, Mr. Abe's rhetoric says Japan should embrace the American style of a more unrestricted, unfettered capitalism, but his policies betray a hesitancy to part too far with Japan's traditions of a more controlled, more slow-growing variety. So does that mean Abenomics, as many critics say, has failed? I don't think so. I'd say there's a decent chance that Japan's economy will be better off for the changes unleashed by Abenomics. I look at it like this. Some part of Japan's long slump was the result of policies and choices that constrained the labor force or labor efficiency. But some part of the slump flowed from what became a self-reinforcing psychology of decline, the vicious debilitating deflationary downward cycle of falling prices, wages, spending, and investment. The extended slow growth created its own defeatist deflationary mindset, in the words of Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda, that sapped risk-taking and animal spirits. In response, Kuroda has unleashed a historic, aggressive expansion of Japanese monetary policy. What you can see here, this is, uh, asset, you know, right now the way the central bank stimulated the economy is to buy assets that get pumped in the economy, and that assets, are assets on the balance sheet as a percentage of the economy for Japan are literally, again, off the charts compared to uh, the ECB um, uh, and the U.S. Federal Reserve. In fact, Kuroda in some ways has been portrayed as a bit of a kind of central banker Dr. Strangelove for his <laughs> sort of kind of crazy aggressive attempt to try and end this deflationary mindset. Um, <clears throat> many economists believe that Kuroda's monetary policy, the so-called first arrow of aggressive monetary policy, on its own can help dissipate that deflationary mindset, the languor, and instill a bit more vigor in Japan's economy. And it should be noted that for all the talk of Abenomics and failure, there has actually been some remarkable success. Monetary policy alone has pushed down the value of the yen against the dollar and has pushed up the Nikkei to more than double since before Abe uh, took office. Companies are now enjoying uh, record profits. Um, now, to be clear, those are all great successes, but sustainable success still isn't guaranteed. Those gains, the strong stock gains and the higher profits, have to flow through more into the real economy. And so far, they haven't in any significant way. Stock ownership Japan in Japan is concentrated, more so in the United than in the United States, so the benefits of the Nikkei boom have not flowed so widely. And as for the record corporate profits, 
companies, rather than putting them to productive use in the form of higher capital spending or wages, are largely sitting on them, the legacy of de deflation era caution. And this graph here shows what you call retained earnings in Japan. And what's remarkable, Japan had historically, through the deflation period, Japanese companies had a tendency to sit on a lot more cash than Americans, mainly because they didn't see a lot of opportunities to spend it. And what's remarkable is that even as profits have hit records, much of that has just landed on Japanese balance sheets. One result of the company's hesitancy to spend is that wages, adjusted for inflation and a sales tax hike last year, have so far gone down under Abenomics. The left side there shows you what has happened to wages actually adjusted for uh, inflation and, and the tax hike. And that helps explain the ongoing wheat consumption and wheat growth. Now, the annual spring labor talks are still ongoing, and there's some hopeful signs that wages finally will, uh, will grow at a decent pace this year. And there's some other tentative hints of turnaround in Japan's economy, uh, particularly uh, a rise in exports. And if all that happens, we could soon see a Japan that's growing a bit faster than it did in the last two decades, say maybe 1% a year. That's not boom, that's not bust, but I guess it's back in a modest question marky kind of way. So thank you very much. All right, stage is set. So. Okay, indeed it is. Thank you. Thank you. What happened there? That's oh, right. I can fix it. That is a formidable um, act to follow, and so I think I'm going to um, mix up my prepared talk just a little bit because I think that uh, some of the themes that Jake identified are similar, and I think I may be able to switch focus a little to talk about uh, primarily how editors make choices about coverage. But I'll start out by situating uh, my own experience because uh, some of you in the audience know I was a correspondent in Tokyo really in some ways during a key time of the boom, 1984 to 1989. And I had a background in East Asian studies, Japanese history, and uh, my professor among many was Ezra Vogel who famously and infamously wrote the book Japan is Number One in 1980 that helped kind of articulate this somewhat wondrous sense. I mean, when I started to study Japan in 1976, everyone kept saying, why? You know, there was absolutely no idea that there was any economic interest. Those of us who were East Asian Studies majors did not see it as a way to make money, which was sort of the second wave. And uh, when Ezra Vogel kind of came out with this, it was sort of like the world woke up a bit to a place they had long dismissed. And I think that is a metaphor for a cycle that we do see in the media and in public consciousness is that, in fact, not just for Japan, but for a lot of our time looking at Asia. I remember in Asian studies, we would study initially the way Americans in the um, 18th century looked at China. Uh, there, there's always this sort of blend historically of hysterically um, exaggerated sense of market potential and terror uh, and a combination of condescension and envy, which I think has marked a lot of the way that Japan and other parts of Asia have been perceived from the American point of view. And I felt, as someone who had some knowledge of Japan, but really more academic knowledge before I went, that my job was in part to try to be a bulwark against the hysteria and try to write as knowledgeably as I could. But I was interested to see in Jake's chart from 84 to 89, the New York Times coverage <laughs> happened to me when I was there. And what's interesting about it is I think, so that was, a, that was demand. You know, people were really, really interested. And then when Japan kind of went into its period of long stagnation, it was very hard to get on the radar. And I, and I think that even when I was foreign editor, which was... Um, 2004 to uh, the, almost the end of 2011, uh, despite my longtime interest in and commitment to Asia, I was almost exclusively focused on war and terrorism. And, and you know, so was the rest of the world and the country. And in a funny way, it's a kind of analog to the Obama administration's, you know, much heralded and never really brought into bear pivot to Asia. Every time they try to pivot to Asia, you know, something happens that drags American foreign policy back into the Middle East and its, 
terror, you know, implosion, um, and chaos. And I, I think that, you know, one of the difficulties is having any kind of consistent attention and consistent demand uh, because of the way that journalists primarily pay attention when something dramatic happens. And Japan's always been a challenge in drama um, because its greatest rewards come when you look under the surface and you chart, you know, methodically and carefully, as Jake did in his speech, the subtleties that don't always come easily to mind when you look at the outside at such a country. So, I, But what I think is really interesting to me is when I think of the way that Japan's boom was generally perceived, I hope, I certainly accept and would be very self-critical, but I think we, those of us in res more responsible publications, I think tried to get at the subtleties, but the fact is what was very interesting was uh, a theme that I see repeated and echoed even in contemporary discussions of China is there's this combination of a kind of wild exaggeration of ability um, with a kind of very self-critical look at what was, say, wrong with the American approach to capitalism. I remember my colleague Bill Emmett, who later went on to edit The Economist with great distinction, wrote a book called The Sun Also Sets, um, which was very prescient, but was really countering conventional wisdom. And his argument was, you know, economic laws apply. And I think for a long time, people forgot that they did. And, and uh, these cycles do show that every time we think someone has invented a new way, it's wise to at least apply a kind of skeptical lens. So I think that there was this sense Japan is invading, Japan is taking us over, we are inept, we are focused on the short term, as Jake said, we, we don't target, we don't do industrial policy, um, we don't innovate. Well, that was proven wrong. That was proven very, very wrong. And we're right in the heart of a place that proved it wrong. But what I think is was interesting, too, is that I always felt that for a long time, just as Japan was overestimated, it was then underestimated. And the kinds of things that any of us who've lived in Japan for a period of time came to respect and admire, which was, as Jake very eloquently discussed, certain kind of choices that were not necessarily great for Japanese economic growth and, and were, in fact, questionable in, questionable in conventional economic terms, were investments in quality of life, in full employment. I, I, I mean, to Jake's point, I always remember and would describe to people uh, the Japanese full employment concept as being applied at my local bakery around the corner from my local subway station, which was, and, and this was, you know, as you often see, a shoebox. You could, it was tiny. And in this tiny little storefront, you had three people behind a counter. You could barely fit one. So one person to take a tongs and take the piece of bread and grab it for you when you point at it, one person to put it in a plastic bag and tie it up, and one person to ring it up. You know, on some level there, you had three jobs when one <coughs> would have done, uh, but, uh, and certainly there were terrible inefficiencies, but there also was the fact that, as Jake said, I remember going back with my family to Japan in um, 2007, expecting to see a really depressed place, and I did not. You know, people were relatively content I couldn't believe the improvements in the subway system. I couldn't believe all the you know, new ways in which you could step on the platform, immediately align yourself with ex exactly what exit you would like to get off on, no matter which stop you were. Just ver the kinds of thought and care to make your daily life um, more pleasant, more thought through, and, and frictionless in the way that we often <coughs> describe. Um, but it's true that that has taken a toll on, on Japanese workers. And one of the things that we tried to look at when I was foreign editor, and again, I admit my attention to Japan was intermittent, even though it interested me because I was so distracted by uh, what was going on in the world, um, the two wars uh, particularly, but all kinds of other disasters and crises. But we tried to do... Um, a look that we called the Great Deflation in 2010. And this was, as I now say, somewhat perhaps exaggerated in hindsight. Um, but again, it had these themes where we, we talked about 
what happens to society that's been in deflation for such a long time? What habits do consumers develop? What uh, policies did Japan undertake that might be an aversive warning to a world that was looking at deflation uh, as, as we were? Um, and so we, we had the same combination of kind of slightly overgeneralizing about the persistent effects of stagnation and immediately turning lens on what could the US learn from or what could Europe in particular learn from Japanese struggles with deflation, uh, which is a still, I think, a relevant question. But um, I think that now that, to me, I always used to say to people, now I have to change it a little, you know, don't count Japan out. This is a society with almost universal literacy, something we've not been able to accomplish in the United States. And it was until 2010, the number two economy in the world, when China surpassed it. I'm struck a great deal um, that there are some very interesting parallels in our arguably problematic coverage of Japan now that we are seeing echoes looking at China. And I think it's worth pausing on those because it's another way in which we could be more uh, self-critical about these swings and generalities. I'm fascinated to see um, a kind of current hysteria about a Chinese model. And this is, is partly about a combination of economics and politics, but we've kind of fallen in love with this idea of kind of managed autocracy. It's much more efficient than democracy. It produces greater economic growth. Um, it's, it, it, uh, so we look at China primarily, but, but also some of the more minor autocracies and the resurgence of a model, just as we thought about Japan being a model in the 80s. We, we talk a great deal about the Chinese model now that we fear that a number of other developing countries will elect rather than the more chaotic and, and you know, cyclical um, model that the United States and Europe have come to champion. And, and I think that it's true that qualitatively, Chinese economic growth is of a different nature than Japanese economic growth was, and arguably more threatening to um, the United States and potentially Europe because China's geopolitical ambitions are distinctly different and it is not an ally in the shadow of the United States as Japan was. Um, and I, so I, I don't want to dismiss all the concerns as unrealistic, but I also think I see a lot of hyperbole um, that is really uncomfortable familiar to anyone who sat in Japan in the 80s and had to try to tamp down some of the hysteria about Japan Invades Hollywood, which was an infamous a magazine cover, and you know we spent a great deal of time in Japan, sort of apologizing for it, I must say. <laughs> um, but when, but it is an interesting moment because you have a leader in Xi Jinping, um, who's articulated a kind of Chinese dream, uh, and a concomitant repression of uh, domestic um, political expression, never robust, but particularly, um, I think under threat right now. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting moment, but I hope we don't repeat some of the mistakes, and I hope that we are able to look more carefully and more skeptically at some of the same issues about, you know, for how long can a rising economy ignore conventional, you know, economic uh, laws that have proven to assert themselves over time? Um, must we assume that uh, the rise of an alternate political and economic system means that the uh, European or Western alternative is inevitably doomed? I mean, certainly it's wise to have that self-criticism at a time when anyone looking at the American domestic political system and its ability to make decisions must be in some degree of despair. Um, but I do think that you know we tend to swing between this sort of adulation and then self-abasement and then terror and then hysteria. And so I think that um, it's a warning signal to try to do as Jake has done in his talk and his reporting, bear down, look carefully under the surface, make sure we're not prey to these um, stereotypes. And that's what I hope a robust press is supposed to do even though you know we fail all too often. So I think with that, I'll pass the baton, and thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, I have known Jake for about uh, 20 years, uh, at, at least by name. Uh, I, first, I got to know Jake's name as a writer who covers the Japanese economy, which has been the main subject of my research in the last uh, 25 or 30 years. And uh, to prepare for, for this um, panel discussion, I did some um, articles, newspaper search, and found Jake had signed article uh, <laughs> in the Asia edition of the Wall Street Journal from 1991 today, uh, 601 articles. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm sure he wrote, he, he wrote more than that, but the signed article is 601, and I used the ProQuest uh, database to find this, a historical newspaper database. And of, of which, of the 601, 177 included the words Japan and the economy. So he's done a lot <coughs> for us, uh, writing about the Japan and uh, informing us who are interested in the Japanese economy. Then, after his return to Japan in, as a uh, chief editor in 2009, mm. I believe, Late, uh, yeah. I, I got to know him in person. And uh, each time I travel to Japan for my research, I try to see him uh, for breakfast and uh, talk, about, talk with, with him about the Japanese economy. So over these years, I benefited from my relationship with Jake a lot in many ways. The first, I learned a lot from his articles, as I said, uh, about the Japanese economy. And, um, um, and then, then uh, second, uh, recently I have been meeting with him uh, in, w w w when I go to Japan. And uh, there, I've been using him kind of as a soundboard. Uh, I try my argument about the Japanese economy, what's going on in Japan, and he gives me some inputs. And also, he, he can tell me what's going on on the ground in the Japanese economy. So it's been very useful. A and finally, uh, Jake helped me publish several opinion pieces in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I counted those articles as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there, there are seven uh, op-ed pieces uh, we did, all of them with my long-term collaborator, co-author, Anil Kashyap at the University of Chicago Business School. So we did uh, seven of those, and uh, Jake helped uh, publish some of those uh, op-ed articles in uh, Wall Street Journal. So I thank him a lot. So, so I'm very glad to know that uh, Jake has received the 2014 Shorenstein Journalism Award this year, and I'm uh, honored to be included in the panel uh, to celebrate this occasion. So I prepared my remark uh, based on my uh, newspaper article search on the news about Japan in major newspaper like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and I prepared four slides. But uh, rather than going through these uh, four slides, uh, I'd like to talk more about the Japanese economy, which uh, the first two presenters talk to, uh, did talk about. So just one thing about the newspaper articles on Japan. So here, what I show is a number of articles that contains a word or phrase, Japanese economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it turns out in ProQuest uh, historical database, the New York Times has uh, uh, longest coverage. Um, but what, what, and we can see this uh, rise of the, news, the number of news articles uh, that contain Japanese economy uh, during when uh, the, in, the, in, in the 1980s. So that fits the pattern of the boom in Japan uh, attracted more media coverage in Japan. But one thing I point out, want to point out here uh, from my research over the last weekend is that the peak actually came in 1990s. Uh, as far as the number of articles contained Increase. the Japanese economy as a phrase, the peak came in 1998, which was a financial crisis. So the bad <coughs> news for the economy was actually uh, attracted more coverage. And we can <coughs> see this in a more recent uh, uh, period, more high frequency <laughs> or quarterly data. <coughs> that I collected for uh, Wall Street Journal, Asia, Asia version, Asia edition of the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, uh, the number of articles. 
and I plotted <laughs> here with the GDP growth rate. Yeah. And what we can yeah. find is uh, mo mostly the negative correlation between the number of articles and the growth rate of the Japanese economy. So whenever <laughs> the Japanese economy is doing bad, uh, there are more articles. Okay. There, there are more nuance to this uh, f uh, figure, and I plan to go into more details, including some regression analysis I did, but, uh, but I skipped that this time, <coughs> and uh, talk about the Japanese economy. Uh, I really liked what Jake, uh, Jake's talk today, and I found that very informative and uh, uh, I interesting. And I echo that uh, uh, w one of the points that Jake's made, that, that is uh, fluctuation of the media coverage uh, I about Japan, especially in, in the US and in the West, reflects the changing view of, of the Japanese economy, that many of the people in, in, in the US and in the West thought the Japanese economy was different and uh, may represent something new, which can't be explained or has, has hard time explaining. And uh, the, I have been doing the research on the Japanese economy in the last 25 years, 30 years. And if I summarize a message from my research in one sentence, <laughs> it would be that the most of what we observe in the Japanese economy can be explained using the mainstream economics. So I here I agree with uh, Bill Emmert's, uh the message that the Japan is not different or not that different. So and and this 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 is the um, I, I think the, the result which has been confirmed by the many episodes in the Japanese economy. The boom in Japan, for example, in the 1980s, at least exposed, turned out to be a classic example of credit boom, and which is uns which was unsustainable and that led to the collapse uh, and the classic financial crisis in the 1980s. Um, I think the same thing can be said for abenomics today. The abenomics, uh, although the terminology is new, if you look into the details, there's nothing new there. It's a combination of macroeconomic, uh, uh, which is a combination of uh, expansionary macroeconomic policy, both monetary policy and fiscal policy, and the supply side policy to increase the productivity of the Japanese economy, which uh, Abe calls a growth strategy. So it's a classic um, the prescription for, the, for an economy which suffers from recession and the growth slowdown. So there's a, n nothing new. Um, so again, uh, what we are seeing here, uh, seeing in Japan, is uh, something that we can explain in mainstream economics. And finally, the Japanese government is trying to use the policies which are uh, implied by a main, main, main or which, uh, which uh, would be recommended by mainstream uh, economics. So let me talk uh, a little bit about abenomics because that's uh, something uh, uh, that uh, Jake started to discuss. And as many of you know, there are three arrows to abenomics. The <coughs> first arrow is monetary expansion. And as Jake mentioned, uh, many economists at least think uh, that has been mostly successful. Uh, at least uh, <coughs> Japanese deflation has slowed down. Uh, Japan is moving from deflation to inflation area. So there, uh, the, uh, the governor Kuroda uh, ha seems to be doing a great job. For the second arrow, which is a fiscal policy, and the third arrow, uh, they still have problems. The fiscal policy is called flexible fiscal policy, which means both fiscal expansion in the short run and fiscal consolidation in the long run. The Jake mentioned the problem of the government debt in Japan. The Japan has a debt to GDP ratio of more than 200% and, and increasing, which is, which is a problem. So they need to contain that at some point. Uh, the government has done, uh, has done a reasonable job on the first part of the fiscal policy, the spending part. <laughs> So they did, did a very good job spending, <coughs> I would say. <laughs> um, but on the second part of the long-run fiscal consolidation, um, 
they still don't have a credible uh, plan to contain the expo explosive growth of the government debt. So as Jake mentioned, uh, they will be, continue to be a problem. And the third arrow, which is the structural reform or the growth strategy, which, which many uh, e economists, uh, including myself, consider to be the most important part of the Japanese economy, um, it has just started. And uh, it, it, as many people argue, it needs more focus. And as Jake emphasized, implementation will be the key. The ideas that uh, Japan, Japanese economy can do better by some structural reforms or economic reforms have been there for a long time. The, the, many, the, the, the problem for Japan was a lack of uh, I implementation. So we, we will uh, won't want to see the more implementation of the growth strategy ideas. Um, and, and here, uh, I, I think the, it, the implementation, e even though the, the, if the implementation or the, if the uh, progress of the third arrow has been satisfactory or not, that judgment can depend on really your expectation and how closely you, you've been looking at the Japanese economy. So um, to many, I think, the many, many uh, as far as the uh, we, we look at the news report coming to the U.S., uh, we see that the, none of these, none of these uh, structural reform has started in Japan. But if you look closely, and if you talk with uh, people like Jake, uh, who uh, <laughs> keep up with uh, what's going on in Japan, uh, there are, something has been done. So some new law has passed, and uh, some attempts to allow, say, the corporations to um, experiment with their uh, new technology uh, ha has been, ha has been uh, set in the new law and the new attempt has started. So there are more has been done than uh, some of us recognized, but at the same time, uh, there are a lot more the Japanese government can do and should do in order to change the economic system. So it's a going forward, it's an important point to look at. And just a one more thing I have is um, um, the one uh, interesting comment uh, we, we saw from, we, we received from uh, the both uh, Jake and Susan is that the, what we observe in Japan is often the result of preference. And I agree with that. And uh, this usually leads to the argument then if the Japanese, so, so, so it's not based on the difference in structure, but the difference in preference. And this argument usually goes to the reasoning that if the, the result is uh, what the Japanese people chose, uh, that must be good. The, so, ah. the, you know, they prefer this idea. But I think there's one area, at least, that we can see that the Japanese preference uh, led to something undesirable. That is, the, because it comes from the preference uh, or the, the preference of the particular part of Japan, not the whole right. Japan. Right. And this is about the pref preference, or it, it's, it's actually about the intergenerational preference. Mm. The, that in Japan, the people tend to respect the old <laughs> and the young need to pay the cost. Or the people who are not born yet does not have any voice. And uh, one reflection of that, if what, what's uh, happening in Japan is a result of the preference, uh, we can explain the debt problem in Japan as a preference or, or as a result of this preference, mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. people who are young or people who are not born yet cannot say anything about <laughs> the increase in the Japanese government debt and increasing implied the tax liability in, in the future. Uh, another thing is that this is also Jake mentioned, um, the employment in Japan was protected during the last decade or the, during the recession. But on the other hand, th that depressed the job creation for the young. A again, this may be the reflection of the preference, intergenerational preference in Japan, which is different fr from the US. But 
the, because of this preference or the, because of the job um, uh, stability of the old people, the young generation, uh, especially if you look at the data, especially <coughs> men, it turns out, uh, suffered a lot in, in the last decade. So, so, so that's uh, another thing we, we need to uh, think about. So let me stop here. Thank you. So uh, we have about 20 minutes, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I would urge people to, uh, first of all, please identify yourselves so the speakers can know who the, is asking the question, but to make your questions brief. And I think maybe what we'll do is we'll collect a few questions and then come back to the panelists. So the floor is open. Uh, I'm Orville Schell from the Asia Society. Uh, Jake, it was very, uh, enjoyed your speech greatly, and I often do have the same sense when I go from China, the uh, so-called success story, to Japan, the basket case. I wonder why does it work so well? Uh, very counterintuitive. I wonder if uh, you three, um, what your view is on the role that culture might have played in all of this. Uh, after all, Japan and China are both Confucian cultures. China had a cultural revolution, largely destroyed its culture, whereas Japan didn't. And I wonder if that conservatizing force, both in a positive and negative sense, has something to do with the way uh, Japan responds. Okay. Yep. Yang Li with um, A Park. Okay. Um, so I had a question about inequality. I was curious during this period of time, during the last two decades and recent years, what was the pattern of wage inequality or wealth inequality? How did that evolve? Um, we know that inequality is to a lesser degree compared to other Western countries, um, but is it still quite low? But or do have we seen any change in that? Carl Schoenberger, and former J Japan hack. <coughs> My first time living in Japan was in the early and then later the late 70s. And I get a sense that uh, economic development was raising the quality of life. People got uh, sewage and Western toilets and generally more leisure time. And uh, in the 80s, uh, it seemed like the quality of life declined. There was a uh, intense uh, booming economy, sacrificing quality of life. There was a phrase, karoshi, death by work. And the workforce was out like out of, out of war foot footing. And <laughs> Since the uh, last decades, I go, I've been back several times, and I got a sense that it really mellowed out. The quality of life has returned. And my question is, what do the Japanese people want? Do they want to maintain their quality of life, or do they want to grow and get back into the race to the top? All right, those are great questions, and I'll turn to the panel. Um, I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, to be honest, I'm not. A, I, it's an excellent question on, on Confucian culture, um, and we had a big piece. I guess it, it was picking off a recent book on that very subject. It's not an area of expertise for me, so I think I'll defer to people who who have more knowledge on that. Um, to the second question on inequality, I, I actually did a piece on that recently after Thomas Piketty came to Japan. I'm afraid I don't have the statistics at hand, but I'd be happy to send you later a link to the article. Um, you know, inequality. Uh, first of all, you have to, as you all know, distinguish between income and wealth, which are very different heart, different things to measure. Um, inequality of income in Japan has grown, as it has in other countries, but by nowhere near uh, the levels that it has, uh, certainly in the United States. And just alluding to the things that Takio uh, had said, um, you know, the, the 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 driving force of inequality in the U.S. One main one, of course, is this incredibly high compensation for CEOs, uh, stock options. Um, in Japan, that has not happened. The, the level of, of high, uh, 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 high pay um, has not tracked that. Uh, and in fact, as, in, as part of that article, I talked extensively with another Stanford colleague, at least for this year, um, Chiaki Moriguchi, who's 
uh, unfortunately not able to make it here today as she's out of town, um, but she's done a lot of study on inequality in Japan. And one of the points that she made was, in some ways you could argue that one of Japan's problems right now is a lack of enough inequality, meaning there are a lot of prominent cases of people who left Japan because they couldn't make their fortune. You know, certainly baseball uh, players are famous examples of that. Um, or the famous, uh, the guy who got the Nobel Prize, um, you know, for the blue laser uh, research, but couldn't essentially make enough on his own in Japan and then took his fortune here. Um, but this, the force I think, that Takeo had talked about is that it's more an inequality between people who have full-time jobs and people who don't. And so you've had a sort of falling down in the bottom. And also, as Takeo said, there's a sort of generational inequality as well. Um, and those are the forces um, that I think have been an, an issue there. Inequality of wealth, um, it's harder to measure, but what's interesting is, and again, this gets to sort of how Japan's chosen to run its economy for probably both good and ill. Forbes last week put out their list of the sort of billionaires, um, and what's striking is I think Japan has four of the top 200 billionaires. China has, I think, 15. India has 12. Um, and it's just remarkable that for an advanced economy, um, the third largest in the world, that there are relatively few people who, who sort of strike out in that level. Um, and to Carl's point, I mean, that's, a, that's a, about whether Japan is, is you know, more comfortable now um, than it was. It's an observation that I've certainly had, and, and my wife, Louisa Rubenfein, who's been watching Japan much longer than I, I think both felt that in our return to Japan in the last four years, people just seem much more comfortable. They seem much more comfortable in their skin, much more comfortable with themselves. And I think there was a, you know, whether it was just being pushed too hard in the late 1980s, um, or the tension of being accused of being on top. I think you know, there's, there may be a cultural predisposition for Japanese to not be comfortable being number one. Um, you know, one of the other, uh, when you were talking about that feeling of, of Kuroshi and, and freneticness in the late 1980s, one of the symbols you may remember when we were there uh, of that was, uh, was Regain. Regain was this energy drink. Um, and they were famous for uh, these, these ads, I won't, uh, punish you with my singing, but but the but the they had a tune that was about businessman, businessman, Japanese businessman, and how they could work 24/7, um, and how this guy in a suit, a salaryman in a suit, was going to slay all his opponents around the world. Regain is still around apparently, and I've heard this from several people, although I haven't checked it myself. But they now have a new ad that says this helps you stay up another couple hours. I mean, it's sort of a much more relaxed version of the same uh, <laughs> same thing. So um, I'll let someone else talk to Orville's question on, on Confucianism and the others as well. Right. Um, well, I'll. It's a difficult and interesting and provocative question that Orville asked. I'll, I'll answer it as best as I can with the caveat that I haven't lived in Japan uh, for a long time. But I remember vividly um, during my time in Japan, 84 to 89, um, I became friendly with a French journalist. And I won't, I won't do the accent, uh, although it was charming and lovely, but he had us to a lovely lunch in his apartment. And he said... You know, I look around me and I see all these people killing themselves with overwork and no one taking any vacation except in the you know same three days twice a year where you can't even get on a train and you know you can't you can't even breathe because everyone is taking their prescribed rest at exactly the same moment. Um, and he said, you know, and then I go back to France and I eat well and I drink well and we take our five weeks of vacation. He said, they want to be number one. Let them. <laughs> Um, and uh, I always, you know, that resonated uh, for me. It was rather interesting <laughs> um, perspective. Um, I think that it's been a really lively debate that isn't solved about to what extent you have a kind of cultural approach that makes a particular economy guides economic decisions or underlies adaptation to democracy, which is actually an area where I'm a little more conversant than I am with economics, to be honest, you know. And, and I think that, you know, one of the most interesting questions about Asia is to what extent has societal success been culturally driven or to what extent is it episodic and depending on other forces? And, and I, I think that, yes, you can say about Japan that certain cultural traits that are bred, you know, taught and affirmed have sometimes driven economic growth, you know, which was a, a long time cultural Confucian, if you will, insistence on literacy and value in education um, and a something that, you know, American parents now know but was true in Asia for centuries, which is the sort of intensive preparation for the narrow path to the elite universities. Um, 
I think that certainly has always underpinned both in Japan and increasingly in China a certain literate, disciplined, productive workforce. Um, but also Japan has historically been held back by um, a, a kind of, particularly Japanese entrepreneurship, a, a kind of aversion to sticking out. Uh, this is all terribly generalized, and I apologize <coughs> for that, but I think you can make some general observations. A sense that, you know, kind of doing something different or aggressive or assertive could sometimes be seen um, as excessively assertive and, and uh, that breaking the rules as they were established, whether the rules of, ha of, of you know, large corporate ownership that inhibited entrepreneurship or, you know, if you look at the infamous case, um, I'm blanking, Jake, but you know the entrepreneur who's gotten into so much trouble. Morty. Morty. Uh, and, you know, in many ways it was his personality that seemed in some ways to really offend Japanese, although he was a legitimate entrepreneur who in an American context would probably have been more successful. But I, I'm also worried about overdoing the cultural argument because I think it often is overdone and you know just as there are many varieties of people um, in the United States so there are in Japan and and that we we sometimes tends to be overly deterministic in the way that we assign the culture a role in economics and so I think I think there is a role but it's usually exaggerated in my assessment okay on uh cultural argument or role of culture in economic development. I, I think the, the discussion was very popular back in early 1980s about the Japanese economic growth and uh, many people came up with the idea, uh, in, for example, Confucius idea may be helpful for the, for the capitalism and things like that. And I think there has been a development since then about this idea of the role of culture or w what uh, are the foundation of the economic development or economic growth. And the one uh, literature which I saw uh, very interest, very important in early 1980s was the uh, thesis advanced by uh, Yasusuke Murakami, uh, my former advisor back in Japan, <laughs> and his co-authors, which focuses more on organizational principle ra rather than the culture. And I think there, there has been a more development these days, and the people focus on institutions, which <coughs> yeah, can include culture, the social interaction, the political institution, economic institution, and all. And here we have uh, Professor Masa Aoki, who has been developing the cons uh, comparative institutional analysis of the economy in the economic development. So, so I, I think the, the, there, there may be a role of culture but uh, it's, uh, I guess we can safely say that culture doesn't determine the economic development model, and the culture can, is uh, one of the factors uh, inf in interacting with a social background, economic inf inf in, uh, institution, political institution, to determine the economic growth. Uh, the second on inequality issue, uh, Chiaki Moriguchi will be back here, and she will give a talk on April 14th, uh, <laughs> noontime, noon as an event uh, sponsored by the Japan program, which I direct. So I invite you back to that program, <laughs> and she will talk about everything you need to know about the Jap Japan's inequality. Uh, finally, quality of life or, or growth. Uh, that may be uh, uh, lucky, or that, that, that may be a choice that old generation in Japan may be enjoying right now, but going ahead for, for, for the future, the young generation or the people who are not born yet, uh, that may not be a choice. In order to maintain <coughs> the current quality of life in Japan, uh, they, the economy continues to grow, uh, at least maintain the current growth rate. And in order to do that, uh, probably they need to continue the, to improve the productivity and so on, so that may not be the choice uh, a a anymore for the future generation. So, a couple more questions, Philip. Hi, uh, Philip Lipsy, Political Science in A Park. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, so, we covered a lot about what's changed in Japan and the U.S. I'm interested in. Uh, Changes in uh, the industry that you work in. Uh, you know, we've we, we, we've heard a lot about downsizing and foreign uh, bureaus being closed down and so forth. But we've also seen the rise of uh, 
social media and other things like that. And so uh, if you have any observations about how those things have changed how you approach uh, coverage of Japan, I'd be interested. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dan. You mentioned that uh, <coughs> the uh, Americans uh, tend to look at tend to look at uh, Japan through the prism, either of uh, fear, uh, because Japan is a threat, or arrogance, because Japan lacks uh, certain uh, qualities. Um, I'm curious, uh, you, and none of you touch much upon politics. Yeah. Um, here we have a situation where from 2004, the end of the Koizumi regime, to 2012, we had a kind of merry-go-round of Japanese prime ministers every year. Now we have a long term of stability under Prime Minister Abe. We have uh, deeply partisan divides in the US, um, dysfunctional <laughs> paralysis in the policy <laughs> process. Why isn't there more focus on politics? Yep. Yeah, I'm take one, I'll exactly. take one more and then we'll, we'll I'm sorry to okay. cut off the conversation, but <coughs> we'll here from the front. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Takeshita. I work for the Asahi Shimbun, but now I'm um, currently with A Park Stanford. Um, as Professor Hoshi mentioned, um, a lot of Japanese economics can be explained by Main Street economics. <laughs> but um, as a journalist, I think your s job is to tell stories, which is very different from just analyzing or explaining. So, are there any particular like indicators or signs on the ground that you pay attention to when you? tell stories on Japan. Maybe you step into 7-Eleven and watch people online, but <laughs> yeah, same. Okay, great questions. All right. Okay, well, I'll start quickly. Probably of the three of us, I'm most in the maelstrom of dealing with um, you know, tumult in the media <laughs> industry. Um, but uh, uh, very briefly, I mean, I think that um, we're at this time of both creative destruction, but also, you know, really wondrous, new, exciting opportunities. Uh, you know, as in many kinds of technologically driven change, both things occur simultaneously. And I think, in terms of foreign coverage, while while many many um, newspapers abandoned foreign coverage, as did a lot of the broadcast media, one of the very heartening things that I see. Uh, is, first of all, the, the largest news organizations, uh, the wire services, the Journal, the Times, uh, have maintained extremely robust uh, foreign coverage, and it, it's our competitive advantage. Um, and we're certainly at the New York Times, I know at the Journal, and our competitors, Reuters, BBC, AP, you know, that's seen as fundamental core identity. Um, and we also see a rise of very vibrant new challengers, such as Buzz BuzzFeed, which actually maintains uh, uh, a in increasing foreign correspondence. Vice, and uh, which whatever you think of it is, as I think, turning a lot of young people on to very um, uh, seductively and aggressively produced videos that um, are awakening them to an interest in uh, foreign lands, and a number of other new media organizations that don't have the print uh, costs uh, legacy structure that has made it harder to maintain these. So I, I actually am more optimistic in many ways about attention and a bit and then the other thing that's happened with social media and with the rise of technology is if you look at something like global post or other areas where we've been able to enable native speakers uh, and others to break through the kind of monopoly that a lot of the established news organizations had about getting voices out and perspectives out so social media has also been I think democratizing in that sense as, as it sometimes can be demagogic also um, so that's a quick snapshot answer to that. Um, politics, yes, absolutely. Um, Professor Okimoto is making an extremely important point. Uh, I, I think that um, both Japanese politics and American politics have been extraordinarily dysfunctional um, in, in many, many ways, and that you know, one of the 
I think that the point that Takeo made that I think was very important is although we see certain benefits for Japanese in some of the economic decisions, it's very important to remember that very few ordinary Japanese, frankly, had any real voice in this, um, in my opinion, that you know the state of Japanese uh, democracy and politics is not inclusive, is still encumbered by old elites, is still uh, very risk averse, is still in hock to a lot of established interests. And in the United States, you know, we are in this particular moment of of political paralysis that we see evidence of every day. So you're right to call our attention to that. Um, and finally, you're right about telling stories. I mean, I think that's why I told the story about the bakery, because <coughs> I think that, you know, rightly or wrongly, journalists do tend, and, and I believe it's, it's quite defensible as long as you do it with sophistication. I always felt as an editor that, you know, you could communicate most effectively if you were able to ground something um, important and significant in, in individual stories that helped illustrate it and capture people's attention and enliven it in ways that, you know, are, are very difficult for conventional statistics to match. So I'm a defender of that as long as you do it with a certain degree of nuance. So I should let others do you speak. Want yeah, let, let me just say one thing about story. And the stories we can read from the newspapers are very important for, for us and very useful for us in making our points even in economics. And as an example, uh, I've been do, uh, talking about the concept of zombie firms for Japan. <laughs> uh, that's one of the researches I've been doing. Those are the companies which should be dead but continue to survive <laughs> and idea. hurt the other companies. And as an example of zombie companies, I always use, uh, I've been using an article from a Wall Street Journal a lot. Uh, not by Jake, but, but your colleague, uh, Fred DeBrock. Uh, yeah. And she did an article about, I, I guess, uh, ten, 10 years ago or so about a uh, hotel in, in Japan and how they are not, their, their restructuring plan or revival plan has been less suc or suc not successful or uh, incomplete. And the point was uh, their revival uh, plan um, required the hotel to have, on average, 2.5 guests per room in order to become profitable, but they have only two beds in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those stories have been very helpful. Um, let me, I'll I guess take these in reverse order. I mean, I think you're asking the absolute right question. Uh, and it's a, such a good question that I was sitting here trying to think in my mind what benchmarks I would give you. And I, I'm embarrassed to confess I can't. So I need to give that some thought and, and get back to it. And I think that would help shape our, our, um, our reporting. I think um, you know there is a danger, as you say also, of the reporting by anecdote versus the reporting yeah. by <coughs> reporting. The anecdotes are useful to illustrating a point, but you also can go too far. And, and one criticism I think that I've rightly gotten when I go to my shtick about how great you know things are in Japan is people say, well, have you left Tokyo lately? And it's true that Tokyo is, in fact, doing remarkably well, but if you go out at least to some of the rural depopulated areas, it's a very, very different story. Um, and so it, there is a sort of balance that you have to strike between the anecdotal and the, and the, the broader points. Um, <clears throat> to Dan's excellent point about politics, I, I have to confess, at least for myself, I left it out mainly because that's my focus of the other talk I have to give tonight. <laughs> and so I didn't want to have too much overlap for those of you who had to listen to me twice. But, uh, but I think that you're right briefly to say in this context that I mean, I do think that one of the things that has also shaped Japan's economy has been this remarkable revolving door that there have been 17, I think it is, people with the title Prime Minister of Japan since 1989. And, you know, if you think about, I mean, we have our own dysfunctions, but if you have a serious problem, whether it's economic or something else, the inability to make any decision of significance in that turnover, I think, has itself been been crippling. And as Susan says, not not really the choice of anybody, but sort of a meltdown in, in a political system. And lastly, to the great question about sort of what's changed in journalism, I agree with everything that Susan has said. I was, I was thinking actually about the changes in covering Japan from 1989, the early 90s, to today. Um, one of the things I started to research but couldn't get hard data on was I was trying to find the number of American foreign correspondents in Tokyo in 1989 versus today. Um, <coughs> I do know without the data that it's gone way, way down. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is the lack of interest in Japan, and one, of course, is, is the stunning downsizing in mainstream media. But what I remember from the time I was in Japan before is, is that even mid-sized papers had Tokyo bureaus at a time when it was incredibly expensive. Dan was working for the Christian Science Monitor 
Uh, at the time, there was someone from the Portland Oregonian, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Toronto Globe and Mail, um, in papers that I think today probably don't have foreign bureaus at all. Um, all had representation there. On the other hand, um, you know, Susan's saying, I don't know that that means coverage of Japan has gone down. Um, I think that it's, it's just emerged in different forms. Um, I think another big change, and largely for the better, for the quality of news um, and for uh, you know the, the 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 timeliness, but not for the quality of life of reporters, is <laughs> is that you know we I used to work for a newspaper that published I think it was, it was the time five times a week, and one of the great things about being uh, in a country that was 14 hours ahead of where the deadlines were is that basically you didn't have a deadline. So I would start my reporting sometime 10 or 11 in the morning finish my reporting maybe 8 o'clock at night, I'd go have a nice long leisurely dinner and then I'd come back to the office at midnight and start writing my story, which still wasn't due for another six hours. Um, you know, now the paper, it's, and I know that change has been going on at the New York Times recently, um, but as well as at the Journal, the print edition is now an afterthought. It's not that we don't care about print, but it's the last thing you think about when a story breaks. The, you, something important happens, you have to get it up somewhere out there as quickly as possible, get it on the website. Um, and there, there's no deadline and there's always a deadline. Um, but the, the sort of new forms of social media also become powerful reporting tools. And I would just end by relating, um, you know, what was, as, as Dan had mentioned, you know, really the most memorable moment of my time as a journalist was being sitting in our newsroom on March 11th, 2011, uh, <clears throat> when the quake hit. And you could feel it massively in Tokyo as well, even though that wasn't anywhere near the epicenter and you were feeling it all day, and um, when it was clear that something significant was going on, uh, we decided to try and send people you know, within an hour up to the epicenter, and it was a huge ordeal for them to, first of all, find a way of getting there, because the trains were shut, you couldn't get a rental car. Finally, some woman's uncle was willing to lend her a car, and this team of three reporters went up north, but they had no way of transmitting anything, and so one of the reporters, Dai Wakabayashi, who's actually now based here in San Francisco for the Journal, just started tweeting and sent this stream of tweets about what it was like to take the trail uh, up from Tokyo to Sendai on that day. And it was truly one of the most moving pieces of journalism I'd ever read. I mean, it was live, it was raw, it was unedited, um, but it was a truly gripping description of an historic moment um, that before the existence of Twitter or other forms of media would have been lost, so. Thanks. Well, I have to make one comment before I close, which is that when I went off to Japan for the Christian Science Monitor, <coughs> I went to lunch with a foreign editor and he said to me, you can only write one article a year about Japanese politics. Because <coughs> that was the time when it was all, it was the most inside baseball of inside baseball politics. I, I did not actually follow that directive. Um, but it's a hard subject to convey to the outside, let's put it that way. So I hope you'll agree with me that two things, one is that, uh, we we'll have very good demonstration of the wisdom of our choice this year in awarding the Shorenstein Journalism Award to Jake Schlesinger. And secondly, that this was a really rich discussion of Japan, and uh, I thought the questions were also fabulous, and I want to thank the panelists and all of you. So. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who didn't get their questions answered, you're welcome to come up Please. and harass <laughs> Jake. <laughs>